Welcome to worship. In these times when it seems increasingly that our way beyond Covid restrictions, anxieties about socialising and attending functions may be more tortuous than we'd hoped a few weeks ago. Cases of the virus are rising, new restrictions will be in place from tomorrow, economic hardship and mental stress are increasing, schools are back at last but who knows if infections may start to spread further as a result. Track and trace isn't really working. People are being sent hundreds of miles to get tested. There won't be a vaccine anytime soon. Apart from that, life is great. No, I'm being serious. Paul tells us to be thankful in all circumstances, which include war zones, natural disasters, persecutions and starvation none of which we are currently experiencing or likely to any time soon. Our Gospel will later suggest that we need a sense of proportion. And while right now is tough for many, there are positives in the situation. And I invite you to take Paul at his word. Without thankfulness, even in adversity, the situation threatens to overwhelm us. But rejoicing is a defence against that. And I know when I feel fed up and frustrated, it's because I haven't managed to get my gratitude motor working properly. So, let us sing.
I want you now to spend a few minutes in gratitude for whatever comes into your mind. You could do worse than look around the room you're sitting in with perhaps triggers to your memory. Remember who bought you that ornament, where you were when that picture was taken, or just let your imagination flow. Be thankful for experiences recent or long past, for meals enjoyed, places visited, fascinating phenomena, events that made a difference to you, pets you have loved, concerts and shows you went to, maybe took part in. I'll leave it to you. Lord, it's for Thee, for Thy coming we wait. The sky, not the grave, is our goal. O Some verses from Psalm 46 with the responses in heavy type that you might like to join in where you are. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth be moved and though mountains tremble in the heart of the sea, though the waters rage and swell, and though the mountains quake at the towering seas. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place of the dwelling of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, therefore she shall not be removed. God shall help her at the break of day. Now some prayers of concern for creation time. In this season of creation time, Acknowledging God's good creation, we pray for proper respect for the creation of which we form part and upon which we depend, for wisdom and understanding in all our human studying of the natural world, for healing for the damage to creation caused by human ignorance, carelessness and wickedness, for an end to the human exploitation of other life forms, for short-term gain and gratification, for wise use of natural resources, for the good of all, rather than the profit of a few. Good Lord, please hear the prayers that we make in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Exodus, chapter 15, verses 1 to 11 and then verses 20 and 21. The Song of Moses and Miriam. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defence. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. 
the Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them. I will divide the spoils. I will gorge myself on them. I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them. But you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. Then Miriam, the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand and all the women followed her. With tambourines and dancing, Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. Thanks be to God. The Parable of the Unmerciful Servant Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell onto his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Now thank we, O Lord God, with hearts and hands and voices, who wondrous things hath done, in whom his world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way, with countless gifts of love, and still is ours today. Oh, may this bounteous God, through all our lives, 
began with Kyle Rittenhouse. I'll do keep up. He was the young man who shot two people dead and injured another man in the Portland riots. 
and he's now at the centre of a huge row about self-defence and the need to protect America against looters and arsonists when apparently the police aren't doing their job properly. What got me involved was an article on a Christian website saying how dreadfully Carl had been misrepresented by the liberal media and how he only did what he did because otherwise he might have been killed. He should be seen as a hero. Evangelicals have already raised more than $300,000 for his defence fund. I commented to the effect that when Christians think it perfectly okay for a teenager to turn up at a riot brandishing a lethal weapon, when they rally to defend this victim of politically correct journalism rather than grieve for his victims, something has gone haywire with their values. Do they really think Jesus would go around toting a semi-automatic? Not all the responses were favourable by any means. Don't I believe in protecting my family was one rhetorical question, meaning, what's wrong with me? Who doesn't even know where to obtain a handgun? Clearly to suggest that the routine ownership of handguns might be some sort of moral issue for Christians is to jump hard on a lot of American corns and it reinforces my view that the word Christian no longer means the same thing on both sides of the Atlantic. And we should be on our guard against allowing our culture to define what being a Christian means as has happened in conservative America. I'm not, for example, going to have the tabloid press tell me to sing earnestly in praise of a god who at the time of Britain's colonial victory in the Boer War had made us mighty, and it would be nice if he made us mightier yet. Land of hope and glory is blasphemous, people! And Elgar would have agreed with me. Sing it ironically, if you will, or because it's a stonking tune, but don't imagine you are singing it to the God and Father of Jesus Christ. In rereading the Gospel for our service, I was struck, and not for the first time, by the cruelty of its ending. Of all the Gospel writers, it's Matthew who ups the violence in his telling of Jesus' parables. So I did some digging around, and I'll share with you what I unearthed, followed by some conclusions for you to ponder. What links this with Kyle Rittenhouse is the idea that there are certain kinds of violence that Christians are okay with, that there is holy violence, that God himself can go in for carnage in some circumstances, and we need to be very wary about endorsing any of that. Truth is, there is plenty in Scripture that portrays God as violent and cruel, and it's provided Christianity's enemies and critics, of whom there are plenty, with a great deal of mud to throw. The easy comparison to make is between the bloodthirsty, nationalistic God of the Old Testament and the loving, all-forgiving, blessed are the peacemakers God of the New, but that doesn't stand up to examination. The Psalms at their best, the second part of Isaiah, written 200 years later than the first, sing the praises of a God who is merciful, who restores, who brings comfort. The New Testament ends with a cosmic war, starring a vengeful Christ, so far removed from the figure of the Gospels that many in the Church from the earliest times, and including Luther, have asked how Christian a book Revelation actually is. In the parables of Jesus, as Matthew tells them, there is plenty of divine violence. The message of our Gospel is clear enough. God forgives even your greatest sin, but only on the understanding that you then forgive any wrong done to you, and if you fail, he will turn nasty, so just you behave yourself. Notice that the king doesn't just have the unforgiving debtor thrown into prison, he has him tortured as well. And that, says Matthew, is how God will treat you unless you forgive those who wrong you. But surely, if we have to be threatened with torture in order to behave well, our actions are of little moral value. Is the difference between becoming a Christian because you love and want to serve God and doing your religious duty because you're terrified of what might happen if you don't. Other parables follow suit. The wedding guest who turns up improperly dressed is bound hand and foot and cast into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that's after the king has declared war on the people he'd originally invited to the banquet and burnt their city to the ground. In the parable of the treacherous tenants, the landowner puts the evildoers to a miserable death. In the parable of the faithful servants, a wicked slave who beats his fellow slaves and eats and drinks with drunkards is cut in pieces by his master. In the parable of the talents, a wicked, lazy servant has his one talent taken away and is thrown into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth again. And in the last parable in the gospel, the sheep and goats, 
Depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, says God on the day of judgment to those who did nothing to help the needy. And as one commentator asks, quoting verses from earlier in this same gospel, what has happened to blessing those who utter evil, acting with non-violent resistance to evil doers, loving your enemies, praying for those who persecute you? The punishments meted out in the parabolic endings present a far different picture of how God acts. Scholars have struggled with this, and rightly so. Attempted solutions include the idea that the violent elements in the parables as they read now were added later to Jesus' originals, or that Matthew is making a distinction between how God acts now and how he will act on the Day of Judgment when we'll be treated exactly as we have treated others. So if we've been cruel and callous, cruelty and callousness will be meted out to us and we shouldn't complain that's unjust. Hmm. Well, if you think that sounds like a return to justice as no more than an eye for an eye, only worse because this time it's everlasting revenge with no possibility of parole, join the club. You may be more attracted to the theory that because the community for which Matthew wrote was particularly embattled, feeling itself under threat from more powerful groups that did not share its beliefs, they needed the reassurance of an apocalyptic vision in which their enemies get what's coming to them. Matthew gives them that reassurance, but at the cost of portraying two versions of Jesus, the Jesus of the Sermon on the Mount, the preacher of non-violence and unconditional forgiveness of enemies, and the Jesus of these parables, who will come again to settle scores and violently punish wrongdoing for ever and ever. But surely it's the beatitude Jesus would need to follow, the peacemaker, the lover of enemies, Otherwise we're in danger of finding support in the Gospels for our own vindictiveness. Maybe even back on the streets with guns blazing, taking life in the name of protecting property and defending our freedoms. Our Old Testament reading celebrates God as the mighty vanquisher of the Egyptians. He drowned them all! Hallelujah! Uh, what about, dear God, couldn't you just have made them stop chasing us? Did you have to kill them all? It's hard not to see a certain gloating in the passage. The warrior god of such books as Joshua in the Old Testament or Revelation in the New are perhaps best understood as projections of our own warlike nature, our own nationalistic pride, onto the divine, an all too human tendency that we have to offset by the nobler vision of a merciful, infinitely forgiving God at the heart of Jesus' teachings earlier on in Matthew and echoed across the loftier and more highly prized passages from Christian scripture. I invite you to re-read the parables in Matthew, a number of which are found nowhere else, and see what conclusions you reach. Here's the truth as I see it. There's an unevenness within scripture, with some passages right up there on the moral and spiritual high ground, and others thrashing around in the footholds or even the swamps. So there's nothing wrong in doing what in practice we all do, which is to base our understanding of God and his purposes towards us on what's best in scripture and let that illuminate those areas that seem murky and problematic. As a mental health chaplain, I would often have patients ask me for a Bible and I sense that they would not be familiar with its contents or know where to start. So I would always give them a little handout, suggesting which bits to read and which to avoid. I'd say, Start with the first letter of John. It's short, direct, and it tells you that God is love. Move on to the Gospels, then Acts, some of the letters, but don't bother with two Peter or Hebrews, and for pity's sake, don't read Revelation. I don't know whether that did any good, but can you imagine a patient with a mental illness serious enough to be on a section, hearing voices, troubled with intense paranoia, reading about cosmic battles and monsters and lakes of fire? But actually, I would give anyone else the same advice. Don't read the Bible from cover to cover. Start with the best bits and work outwards, and as it were, downwards from them. Think of God not as the smiter of Gentile armies, but as Jesus asks us to think of him, as Abba, Father, or rather, Abba, Daddy. Use that as your template. And if in reading the Bible you come across passages that make you say, hang on, that's not very fatherly. I'm not the perfect dad, but I wouldn't treat my kids as cruelly as that. Hold those passages up to the light of the greater and more fundamentally Christian insight. The lectionary itself is very selective, and if you never read outside the set passages for Sunday worship, 
There'll be a lot of Bible material that you never get to hear or be asked to reflect on. But let me reassure you, it's fine to cream off the best of the Bible and let that be God's word to you. Now, you don't need a sacred text or a holy teacher to tell you that violence against another person is usually wrong, or at the very least requires some kind of moral defence. When a sacred text or holy teacher is quoted in justification of some war or some initiative that divides people from each other, that identifies some other group as the enemy who must be enslaved or driven from among us, some things are amiss. The Bible has often been, and still is, co-opted to support thoroughly unbiblical, or at least unchristian, projects. I'm haunted by this quote from an atheist who says, There will always be evil people who do evil things and good people who do good things, but to make good people do evil things, that takes religion. All right, it's unfair. It's an overgeneralisation, and we can all tell stories about bad people who've been transformed by their encounter with the gospel but it's hit the spot often enough historically to make us wince. Passages from scripture have been used to promote intolerance, discrimination, racism, sexism, as it's easy enough to see in America right now, but not only in America, and there may be instances much nearer home. So let's be careful when we believe X because of what the Bible says that we know we've got things the right way round. Not that we believe X anyway, and can quote a few verses that support X, and never mind if there are one or two others that don't. We must beware of using the Bible to shore up a prejudice that, as it happens, requires no change in our lifestyle, but blames other people for not being like us. A friend recently quoted at me Romans 14 verse 2, one man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables, as if to prove that my long-standing vegetarianism proves how weak my faith is. He was, of course, having a laugh, but note that he, the wretched consumer of slaughtered animal flesh, was using scripture to prove that I had to change my behaviour, whereas he was fine with his. It would not be hard to think of utterly serious examples of the same kind of literary abuse. In returning to the parable and wrapping all this up, may I suggest we take away a different message and forget the violent conclusion. This is a story about having a due sense of proportion. Even if you're not familiar with first century Palestinian currency, you may suspect that the 10,000 talents owed by the debtor to the king and the 100 denarii owed to him by the servant, between those things there is a bit of a discrepancy, and trust me, it's much more than a bit. 100 denarii would be like three months' rent. 1,000 talents corresponds to 160,000 years of regular income, an impossible amount. Jesus was clearly playing this either for laughs or a, a gasp of disbelief. No way could anyone mount up that much debt. Yet even that sum is written off by the king. And the debtor then loses his rag about the tiny amount he's owed. The parable might in a way end right there. Its main point is made. Every one of us is in possession of the most fantastically complex object ever to emerge in the universe, so far as we know, the human brain. It treats us to an infinitely vast range of thoughts, sensations, experiences, imaginative possibilities, and I personally try to spend some time every day pondering some aspect of that complexity, to marvel at the fact that I know I'm alive, little me, in this enormously vast universe. That's my 10,000 talents of indebtedness, and set against the few hundred denarii of frustration, disappointment, discomforts, anxieties of everyday life, especially just now, I'm really... What have I got to complain about? Is it so much to ask that we can keep on forgiving our brother even 490 times, by the end of which we have lost count, which is the point of course, when we are in another sense so deeply indebted to God for our very being? The 10,000 talents need not be sins, simply the price that our Creator has gone to, the lengths of time the universe has gone to, to produce each of us. When we woke up this morning, we had more to be grateful for than we could ever pay back were that a consideration. And as someone said, if you have food and shelter and reasonable health, that's blessing enough. Everything else is perks. And what a lot of perks there are. So see this parable as not only about the need to forgive, but to keep a sense of proportion in the midst of uncertainty and hardship. We have been blessed more than we can ever repay. Amen. On Saturday, I had to miss Synod. No, it was even sadder than that. 
but it was a Zoom synod, so it was perhaps more missable than some. One part of it will have considered the Methodist way of life, and I've asked for that to be read now, after which I will make a comment and then lead us into some prayers. It's structured according to the fourfold pattern of our calling, with which I imagine that you are familiar. The Methodist way of life. The calling of the Methodist Church is to respond to the gospel of God's love in Christ and to live out the discipleship in worship and mission. As far as we are able, with God's help, first of all, worship. We will pray daily. We will worship with others regularly. We will look and listen for God in Scripture and the world. Then we go on to learning and caring. We will care for ourselves and those around us. We will learn more about our faith. We will practice hospitality and generosity. And then thirdly, the service. We will help people in our communities and beyond. We will care for creation and all God's gifts. We will practice hospitality and generosity. And then we go on to service. We will help people in our communities and beyond. We will care for creation and all God's gifts. We will challenge injustice. And then we go on to evangelism. We will help people in to speak about the love of God. We will live a way that draws others to Jesus. We will share our faith with others. May we be a blessing within and beyond God's church for the transformation of the world. You will notice that those commitments are not especially Methodist. Some of them aren't especially Christian. We will care for ourselves and others. We will challenge injustice, we will practice hospitality and generosity. Nothing is said about doctrine, this is about how we are to live rather than what we believe. But unless we have beliefs and can put them into words, we will not be able to fulfil the commitments under that fourth heading of evangelism. It's always those that challenge us the hardest. And I do wonder about speaking of the love of God. We will speak of God, okay, and he is love, but that is not his only attribute. At a day conference I attended recently on Christian responses to the pandemic, the question was asked, how can you speak of the love of God in the midst of so much distress, anxiety, suffering, confusion, hardship, untimely death? With great difficulty is the honest answer. But Christians can still speak, perhaps of God's presence through this time of crisis, or of his hiddenness, of his mysterious ways that are not ours, or of his call to endure through suffering, to support one another, maybe even learn from this time of great trial. So now let us pray. Dear God, thank you that you have called us to follow a way of life as proclaimed and made incarnate in your Son Jesus. Help us now to reflect on the commitments set before us and seek, as we honour them, to grow in discipleship and witness to your gospel. In our worship, physically separated from each other as we are, help us to be mindful of those who feel their isolation most keenly, who gain little from electronic forms of communication, and for whom only the real presence of other people can console and lift their spirits. May they not feel abandoned. Help us find ways to reach out and include them. 
in our learning and caring. May we use the opportunities we have to discover new insights in, about our faith as we eavesdrop on different forms of worship, listen to preachers thousands of miles away, discover what resources of study and discussion are available online, and help us to take our lessons back into our own fellowship here in the circuit and with Christians from a range of traditions. May we be sensitive to the different kinds of vulnerability that others are feeling as a return to normal life seems to evade us, and they feel the frustrations and fears of coping with the regulations made necessary to keep the virus at bay. We pray for all who have been more directly affected by the disease, whether in their own person or through a close family member, for all who know they've been in contact with an infected person and are waiting to hear their own test result. As we see the daily figures of new cases, help us to see that behind the statistics are human beings just like us. In our service, may we reflect on the inequalities exposed by the pandemic, on the different sectors now feeling neglected and threatened by the withdrawal of funds that other projects seem to attract and help us to prioritise as individual Christians and as churches the needs we must address most urgently. We pray justice for all who experience discrimination, bullying, hate speech and abuse and as heat waves and wildfires, as plastic pollution and deforestation continue to remind us of the climate crisis which will still be with us even when we've all had our COVID vaccinations, may we continue to press and campaign for urgent action to avoid calamity. In our evangelism, dear God, we pray that while actions speak louder than words, there must still be words for the actions to be louder than. So when we have chance to share our story, to speak of our experience, to point others to the transforming power of your gospel, may we find the power to say what can be said and to leave unsaid what we can only allude to in stories and metaphors. Defend us from jargon, from tweeness, from making light of the truly important and from making the basic truths sound more complicated than they are. We remember that Jesus preached to the illiterate and uneducated yet got his message across with stories and pictures. May what was good enough for him be good enough for us too. And so we gather all our prayers together as we say the words that Jesus gave us.
And so our service comes to a close. A big thank you to everyone who's taken part in it. To Steve for editing it all together. To the band for playing all the songs. And to those who read the passages from scripture. And the Methodist way of life. So it just remains for me to give a benediction. May the one to whom every knee shall bow and every tongue praise enfold you in loving kindness. May the one who was nailed to a tree for challenging the powers give you grace to challenge the lies of this age. May the one who sustains creation inspire such love in you that you remain unsatisfied until the earth is healed. May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love now and always.